All right, so we've been talking about momentum. And we really kind of initially defined momentum as inertia in motion. So we're talking about a mass that's moving. And that really goes back to Newton's first law. An object in motion will stay in motion, an object at rest will stay at rest, until it's acted upon by an outside force. So it's that outside force that we kind of want to focus on now and how that actually changes the momentum. So for example, we've got football. Now, if we watch this hit, <laughs> it's, it's a good one, right? So that guy's on the ground. So we have two really big, massive guys, and we, they are moving pretty fast, and then they collide. So there is definitely an outside force acting on both of those guys. <clears throat> and what happens is both of their momentums come to zero, right? So they're both in motion. There's an outside force. They come to a stop. So their momentum changes. Now let's look at this one. What's different there? Think about that collision and the first one that we looked at. This one doesn't look near as painful. And why not? When you think about it, that momentum took longer to change. Okay, so the force that was applied in the first clip was very quick. It was like hitting a wall. The force that's applied in this particular clip takes a little bit longer. So it's actually taking more time to change that moment. Okay, So that's what we really want to look at. We want to look at the collision itself and what kind of forces are involved and, and at the time that it takes for that momentum to change. Now, when we talk about a change in momentum, the term for that is impulse. Okay, So an impulse means a change in momentum. So when we talk about the impulse applied during a collision, what we mean is, what is it that caused the change in momentum? Now remember in science, we have uh, delta P, right? Delta P is a change in momentum. So remember that little triangle, that triangle stands for a change in. And since it's followed by the symbol for momentum, we're looking at a change in momentum. Now, this is a very specific way to find this, right? Change in always means final minus initial. So when we have the momentum symbol, that P, with no apostrophe, it represents the final momentum. When we have the P with an apostrophe, it represents the initial momentum. So a change in momentum is equal to the final momentum minus the initial momentum. So let's look at an example. We've got a water balloon, pretty big one, half a kilogram water balloon. We're gonna throw it against a wall. So the speed that we throw it with is 32 meters per second, and then it's gonna to come to a stop. So we wanna know what is its change in momentum. Well, we know that change in momentum is found by taking the final momentum minus the initial momentum. The problem is we don't know the momentum. In our problem, we're given the mass, the initial velocity and the final velocity, but we aren't given the momentum. So the question becomes, can we find it? Well, yes, we can. See, this is where physics gets really interesting. A lot of times you're given a problem and you know the equation that you need to solve it, but you don't have all of the tools, so you have to go fill in all those blanks. So we know that momentum is equal to the mass times the velocity. So we can find the final momentum. Final momentum is gonna be equal to the mass times the final velocity. And since it came to a stop, the final velocity is going to be zero. So the final momentum is going to be zero kilogram meters per second. We can do the same thing with the initial momentum using the initial velocity. We still have a mass of 0.5 kilograms, but it was moving at 32 meters per second. So the initial momentum was 16 kilogram meters per second. Now that we know the final momentum and the initial momentum, we can subtract those. This is where your, your positives and your negatives are gonna be really, really important because our final momentum was zero and our initial momentum was positive. So our change in momentum is a negative 16 kilogram meters per second. So what if we have a bouncy ball instead? Okay, same mass, we're throwing it at the same velocity. 
The difference is that bouncy ball is not going to come to a stop at the wall. It's going to bounce back. And we're just going to say it's going to bounce back with the same speed. What is its change in momentum? Well, again, change in momentum is final minus initial. And again, we don't know the momentum. We're going to have to go find it. So momentum is still mass times velocity. And our initial momentum, let's just say we are throwing the ball towards the wall. So it is moving to the right. Okay? So we're going to say that it has a positive 32 meters per second as its initial velocity. So when we find our initial momentum, we're going to take one half of a kilogram multiplied by a positive 32 meters per second. That's going to give us a positive 16 kilogram meters per second as our initial momentum. All right, now here's where we gotta pay attention because what happens when that ball hits the wall? It's gonna bounce back and it's going to be moving in the opposite direction. The opposite direction means that we're going to use the negative sign for our velocity. So our final velocity isn't just 32 meters per second, it's a negative 32 meters per second. So we're going to take that times our half a kilogram and we're going to find that the final momentum is negative 16 kilogram meters per second. So now that we have our final and our initial momentum, we can find the um, change in momentum. Now again, final minus initial. Final momentum was a negative 16 kilogram meters per second. We are going to subtract our initial momentum, which was a positive 16 kilogram meters per second. So our change in momentum is going to be a negative 32 kilogram meters per second. So we've defined impulse as a change in momentum. We can change our momentum in a couple different ways. Since momentum depends on mass and velocity, we can either change our mass or we can change our velocity. Right? Now, typically our mass doesn't change. Uh, we like to keep those constant, so we're going to really just focus on that change in velocity at this point in time. So when do we have a change in velocity? What has to happen? That object in motion will stay in motion until acted upon by an outside force. So to change an object's motion, it's necessary to apply a force against its motion for a given period of time. Right, so we have to take that, we have to apply a force. So we have to apply a force in order to change the velocity. This is actually Newton's second law. We'll get into that a little bit more later on. But we can write that in terms of either mass times change in velocity or the average force applied over a given amount of time. So now we have two definitions really of an impulse. An impulse is a change in momentum. But we can also define it in terms of the force that's applied during the collision. So now we have two equations. We have our change in momentum is going to be equal to our mass times our change in velocity. It is also equal to our average force times our time. That also means that we have two ways to write the units for impulse. The first one is just what you might think of in terms of change of momentum. We have our mass times our velocity, so it'll be kilogram times meters per second. But now that we're adding in force and time, remember we measure force in newtons and we measure time in seconds. So we can also record it as a newton times a second. Now when we get into forces a little bit more, uh, we'll talk about why those two things are the same. Uh, for right now, just believe me, uh, we'll, we'll show that mathematically later on, but not today. <clears throat> Okay, so this does a couple things for us. So we can minimize the force of a collision by increasing the time that it takes for that collision to occur. All right, so think about catching a baseball. Why do you use a mitt? Now the obvious answer there is to say, well, for cushion. All right, so what does that cushion mean? If you cushion something, what that means is you're taking the time of collision and you're making it bigger so it doesn't hurt as much. Why is a catcher's mitt so much bigger than an outfielder's mitt, right? It's a lot more force on those pitches than there typically is on a hit ball, right? So when you smash that ball into your hand, it doesn't hurt near as bad. Have you ever been bungee jumping? Why is the cord stretchy? Why don't you use just a rope to jump off of a bridge? 
you can probably imagine um, the collision time for a rope as compared to a stretchy band is going to be a lot less. So if we increase the time of that collision, if we increase the amount of time that it takes to bring you to a stop after you jump off that bridge, then the force acting on you is going to be a lot less. This can also apply if we have a, a limited amount of force. So you can only swing a bat so hard. So there's some maximum amount of force that you can use to swing a bat and hit a ball. But when your coach tells you to follow through, do you know why he does that? What you're doing is you're increasing the time of that collision. So even though you have a certain amount of force, you're applying that force over a longer period of time, you're gonna have a bigger change in momentum. We can go the other way as well. If we decrease the amount of time that it takes for a collision to occur, the force will increase. So we've got our karate guy over here, <laughs> kind of funny looking guy. Um, we've got our karate guy over here. If he wants to break those bricks, he's going to have to apply a force over a very short amount of time. And what that will do is that will apply a larger force than if he were to apply it in over a larger amount of time. Let's say we have our tackled football player who experiences a force of 800 newtons for 0.9 seconds, and we want to determine the impulse. All right, so we know that impulse is delta P, so it's going to be the force multiplied by the time, which is nice because that's what we have. We have 800 newtons, so we have 0.9 seconds. So we're going to take our 800, we're going to multiply it by 0.9, and we're going to find our impulse of 720 newton seconds. So what is this change in momentum? Now think back for a minute because impulse is defined as change in momentum. So the impulse and the change in momentum are going to be the same thing. So we can write our momentum change as 720 kilogram meters per second. So we have a 1.2 kilogram model rocket engine and it is designed to deliver an impulse of 6 newton seconds. So if the rocket engine burns for 0.75 seconds, what average force does the engine produce? All right, so what do we know there? We are looking for the average force, and the equation that we have average force in is the impulse is going to be equal to the average force times the time. All right, so we're trying to find average force. So to get average force by itself, we're gonna divide by time. So we end up with the delta P is gonna be divided by time to find the average force which is nice because we know time and we know our impulse. So in order to solve that particular problem, we're just gonna take our six Newton seconds and divide it by 0.75 seconds. And when we get that, we'll have an eight Newton force. So with what velocity would that engine take off? Well, okay, we just found the force and we know the mass and we know the impulse and we know the time. We also know that impulse is equal to the average force times the time. It is also equal to the mass times the change in velocity. So the force times time is equal to the mass times delta V. So we can set those two parts of the equation equal to each other. So the average force times time divided by mass will be equal to the velocity. We do know all of those things. We know the force, the mass, and time. So we just plug those in. We have eight Newtons time 0.75 seconds divided by 1.2 kilograms. And we're gonna multiply our eight by 0.75, divide by 1.2, and we're gonna get five meters per second. 